Hi, everybody. Good turnout. Uh, school starts now, and uh, I am personally delighted to open a uh, conversation between somebody or other over here and our own uh, personally minted Rob Litvak. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, uh, President and CEO of the Center, and uh, Rob Litvak is a long-standing and trusted member of the Wilson family. In fact, he's been at the center uh, for a humble 28 years longer than I have. That's four years after the Iranian Revolution, and for those of you keeping track, two years before the release of Back to the Future. Who knew? Uh, point being, the center is lucky to have someone who, for so many years and across so many crises, uh, has provided thought leadership on the nuclear ambitions of Iran, North Korea, and other countries, and who's got 10 books, 10, to prove it. Today, we're celebrating the release of his latest monograph, Nuclear Crises with North Korea and Iran, which is an analysis of nuclear diplomacy updated for the Trump era. Uh, maybe you need to update it again, Rob, given events of the last two days, but hey, um, we'll give you a chance. Uh, in particular, Rob digs into the idea of transactional versus transformational diplomacy. Should the United States focus on solving the nuclear challenge on its own, as with transactional, as with the transactional 2015 Iran deal, or is it better to address all of the regime's malign activities at once, as the Trump administration has tried to do with the transformational approach that repu repudiates the 2015 deal. Spoiler alert, Rob is in favor of transactional diplomacy, as he will shortly, shortly explain. But regardless of the answer, Rob's contributions at the center as senior vice president and director of international security studies, those are two titles, have definitely been transformational and not transactional. He is a prime example of finding the trend lines across the headlines. Uh, also joining to discuss Rob's book is this guy over here to my left. Uh, he is a former Wilson Distinguished Scholar who moonlights as the national security correspondent for the New York Times. Just ask him, he'll tell you. Why is he famous? Because he wrote his book, The Perfect Weapon, at the Wilson Center. Right, David? And the inheritance. And the inheritance. Oh, that's right. Two books. That's okay, right. you he's. You weren't here for the first one. I, I well, <laughs> then, then it didn't happen. If I wasn't here, it, it didn't happen. But the point is, David is a distinguished scholar at the Wilson Center, and sort of, kind of, uh, he writes for the failing New York Times in his free time. So we look forward to Rob and David's discussion of the. Uh, uh, of this book, and for those of you who may not know this, the book is available outside. Don't run out now. Wait until you know about it, and then run out and get your own copy. David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and thanks to all of you for coming, and thanks to Rob for another um, terrific book. I keep these um, lined up by my desk for when I um, run into periodic uh, Iran and North Korea crisis stories, which is about three times a week, something like that, yeah. Um, so Rob, we'll, we'll get in a moment to um, some of the specifics of why the Iran case and the North Korea case are so different mm -hmm. from each other. But let me um, just start with the concept that's on the title, which is from transformational to transactional diplomacy, um, and ask you to tell us a little bit about um, what it is that makes transactional diplomacy, what it is that defines transformational diplomacy, how they interact with each mm -hmm. other, and then we can, we can begin to put the North Korea and Iran negotiations into those categories. Thank you, David, and thank you, Jane, for the introduction, as well as th thanks to all of you for coming today. Yeah, my starting point for this monograph was to take the classic public policy analysis dichotomy, transactional and transformational, and apply it to nuclear diplomacy. Transactional diplomacy is discrete, uh, limited just to the nuclear issue, whereas transformational diplomacy, as connoted by the, 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 the word, aspires for comprehensive change across the full spectrum of foreign policy and national security concerns. Now, an important contextual starting point as well 
is that the Trump administration designated both Iran and North Korea as rogue states. That's a theme I've written on in the past. It's, it's a term that entered the US foreign policy lexicon at the end of the Cold, Cold War. It's a unilateral American political concept without standing in international law. And it denotes states pursuing nuclear capabilities and using terrorism as an instrument of policy. Saddam Hussein, of course, was the archetype rogue. The others in the rogues gallery were Libya, Iran, and North Korea. Those were the, the core group of, of rogues. Uh, the term has a connotation, uh, baggage, it, and that connotation is essentially irrationality, crazy states. Uh, and that the threat posed by these states derives from the character of their regimes. Therefore, behavior change is inadequate because you can turn to turn off the behavior that's threatening, you need to go to the source, which means the, the character of the regime changing regimes. Uh, that argumentation was central to the case for a preventive war of regime change uh, in Iraq in 2003. Now, the United States may assert a general interest in nonproliferation, but our policies focus on adversarial proliferators, states that combine capabilities with hostile intent. So with reason, uh, U.S. policy makers focus on Iran and North Korea uh, more than Israel uh, and India. Now, in approaching these two challenges that we're, we're addressing today, North Korea and Iran, we face the dilemma of competing timelines, two timelines. One for the acquisition of nuclear capabilities, the other for regime change or evolution. And that's the bind. These timelines are not in sync. The nuclear challenges are immediate and urgent, and we can't wait for some indeterminate uh, timeline for regime evolution or regime change to play out while these states develop these, these capabilities. So with both Iran and North Korea, the Trump administration aspires to the transformational. Now, that's ironic. He wrote the book, The Art of the Deal. You'd think he'd be inherently transactional. He is a transactional in a host of contexts. But with respect to these, these two cases, at least aspirationally, the administration has been transformational. In the case of Iran, Secretary of State Pompeo laid out 12, as he put it, 12 very basic demands, uh, what I'd call the full Monty, uh, the re requirements that range from the dismantling of Iran's uranium enrichment program to the cessation of, of missile tests, withdrawing uh, Iran's revolutionary guards from Syria, ending the regime's support for Hezbollah, et cetera. Um, though the administration has denied that its uh, uh, objective is regime change, meeting the Pompeo parameters for Iran would essentially require a change of regime uh, in, in Tehran. And a smart friend of mine, Viz, this guy, uh, put it that the Pompeo parameters essentially would require Iran to no longer be Iran. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's a fair characterization. With North Korea, uh, the U.S. demand for full de denuclearization would de deny North Korea the capabilities that it feels it needs to deter uh, a t attack from outside, and uh, which the Kim regime views as essential to, to, re to regime survival. The, the uh, demands with North Korea are transformational, but not in, a, in as overt a manner, a way as with respect to, to, to uh, Iran. Uh, the North Koreans have been quick to point out that neither Saddam nor Gaddafi had nuclear weapons, uh, and they were toppled in 2003 and 20, uh, 2011, respectively. Uh, and that Gaddafi had been duped by U.S. diplomacy into giving up his nascent nuclear capabilities in, in the diplomacy, the deal of 2003. So for the Kim family, the Kim regime, zero warheads is simply not on the negotiating table. It's not an option. Uh, and as I, as I stated, to the extent that the U.S. objective is denuclearization up front, uh, that objective is transformational. A senior State Department official discussed the two cases, Iran and North Korea, and the transformational character of the U.S. approach. He said, quote, we are trying simultaneously to pressure uh, and to negotiate comprehensive solutions with two rogue regimes at the same time. But this very ambitiousness is a strength, not a weakness, close quote. Um, let me just give me another couple minutes just to lay out the, the basic argument of the, of the monograph, David. Trump called the Iran nuclear agreement the worst deal ever uh, and uh, withdrew in t May 2018. The JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, was quintessentially transactional. It was a deal, not a grand bargain, 
the Obama administration made the pragmatic determination that if it sought to expand the scope of negotiations to encompass a whole, whole host of other issues, that it would have achieved no deal uh, uh, at all. Uh, and that really opened the door for the opponents of the JCPOA. Um, they've called for a better deal. But the crux of their cri criticism was essentially that the JCPOA was transactional, not transformational. So for the critics, it's not a question of are they permitted 5,000 centrifuges under the JCPOA or 4,000 centrifuges. It's really doing any type of deal uh, with, with Iran and that the JCPOA, by only addressing the nuclear question, didn't address all of the other aspects of Iran's quote unquote malign activities uh, that derive as they, as they view it from the character of the regime. Hence this continuing tension of objectives, whether the US goal should be behavior change or, 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 or regime change that continues to play out in the current administration. Now the open question at the start of the Trump administration was whether the JSPOA, this model of constraining capabilities in a transactional mode, discrete, constraining, not eliminating capabilities, whether that offered a relevant precedent for North Korea. Uh, President Trump assumed office at a crisis point uh, when North Korea was on the cusp of being able to target the U.S. homeland with a nuclear uh, weapon. That was the game changer for the United States. North Korea has been a nuclear weapon state since 2006, but it was really the ability to target the United uh, States. On this day in 2006. Happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> wow, hadn't, no, hadn't, hadn't, hadn't noted that. Um, being able to, to target the United States, and President Trump in his preferred medium tweeted, it won't happen. Well, 2017, we saw this significant escalation. It was an escalation <clears throat> in the tempo of North Korean testing, two nuclear weapons tests, 25 ballistic missile tests. This looked like the Manhattan Project. To, to, to acquire the capability to target the United States. And, it was, a, and uh, it was accompanied by a rhetorical escalation that we'll recall. Uh, President Trump used the, the, the term fire and fury. Um, the North Koreans sent most Americans to a dictionary by calling Trump a dotard. Um, uh, Trump called him little rocket man. The North Korean Ministry of Information gave them full marks for creativity. They responded with their own Elton John lyric. They called him madman across the water. Um, uh, uh, but underlying this escalation, rhetorical as well in terms of capabilities, you had the makings of what uh, I called a slow motion Cuban missile, missile crisis. And the context of that crisis was, was framed by the optic through which, the prism through which the North Korea is regarded, a rogue state. Hence, National Security Advisor McMaster uh, asserted that classical th deterrence theory won't work with North Korea because of the character of the regime. It's essentially an irrational regime, a crazy state. Um, Secretary Pompeo, who was then Director of Central Intelligence, highlighted the same uh, dynamic, that the threat is linked to the character of the regime, where, where he, when he stated that the issue with North Korea was not just that they were developing capabilities, it was capabilities as he put it, in the hands of the character who holds control over them today in North Korea. Hence, kind of underscoring that threat is linked to the character of the regime. It's not just the capabilities. Interestingly, even though we'll talk about the, the impasse on the denuclearization, the Trump-Kim summit meetings, there have been, been three meetings so far, two summits and one meeting at the DMZ, They've changed the psychology of the crisis. They haven't, un they haven't addressed the capability side, but they changed the psychology of the crisis in terms of this perception of, 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 of threat. In a sense, the, these meetings have normalized Kim, brought him onto the world stage. North Korea is no longer viewed as a crazy state. Um, but the fundamental impasse over the extent of North Korean denuclearization and in turn, the pace for US sanctions relief, and I'm, I'm, we're gonna turn to that issue, that impasse has, is now evident. Meanwhile, with Iran, the United States really ramped it up. Um, and, and we've essentially been waging economic war on Iran during the Trump administration. There's an effort to block all oil exports from Iran and the use of secondary sanctions to, to uh, uh, essentially bully US allies uh, from engaging in commerce in Iran. So a country, you know, company like Siemens is given a choice of you can do business in Iran or you can do business in the United States, but you have to make a choice. Secondary sanctions are, are um, uh, extraterritorial and, and controversial. And there's also been um, uh, um, a, a spike in military tensions culminating 
in the September 14th attack on the, so on the Saudi oil uh, facilities. Um, and Iran is pushing the envelope on the JSPOA constraints. They've begun to enrich uranium beyond the, the agreed limit. Uh, they're d ex exploring modernization of centrifuges. As General Mattis is fond of pointing out, the enemy gets a vote too. So basically, that's the, that's the context of my analysis and the it frames the current impasse that we're at, where essentially we've seen the limits of the Trump administration's policy of maximum pressure. And maximum pressure is not a strategy. Um, it, it's, it's a set of instruments that they brought to bear. But to brought to bear for, to what end? And we're left with the same three bad options we've, we've had all along with these, these two countries. Bomb, negotiate, or acquiesce to, to bad things happening, to them continuing to build these capabilities. I make the analytical case why a pivot to transactional diplomacy could essentially make a bad situation, prevent a bad situation from getting worse. But the question is whether uh, uh, that analytical judgment will be reflected in a political judgment by the policymakers, whether they're willing to and how they would negotiate such a pivot. Well, that's a great um, uh, layout of, of the argument. So let me, uh, a few things struck me in, as I was reading it through again um, last night. And um, let me do one question that's on this transactional versus transformational concept, and then we'll dive into the, to the individual cases. So you largely treat states in this as if they're of a single approach. And of course, in this administration, that's a hard thing mm -hmm. to do. So I'm in complete <laughs> agreement that the Pompeo plan, where he laid out the 12 points, was a transformational effort. And while JCPOA, when it was signed in 2015, was certainly transactional, it had a transformational gloss about it because uh, uh, President Obama said outright that if this worked, it could be the beginning and the best of days of a new transformed relationship. He didn't suggest that the regime would necessarily change, but that their behavior would transform. In the Trump time, however, I don't see anything transformational in the approach to Iran that Trump himself is doing. First of all, I don't think he could name for you the 12 steps that, that uh, uh, Pompeo uh, has asked, because when you talk to him about the subject, he's got one or two of them that he focuses in on, mm -hmm. and the others are pretty much you know, in the noise level. But secondly, as we learned at, the, at, at UNGA two weeks ago, he is desperate for what he said outright was a deal, right? And the deal would be a highly transactional deal. So is this really a transformational approach that the administration is taking, or do they have a transformational cover over a really transactional presidential policy? That's a great question. I think that what is going on is that this persisting tension, persisting tension in U.S. policy between the regime change, behavior change debate is playing out now in the Trump administration, and there are conflicting signals and certainly mixed messages. On Iran, I think you're absolutely, you're absolutely right, and, and uh, uh, I'm in violent agreement that, that underlying uh, the transactional JCPOA, um, and it actually was in my, this point was made in my monograph, but I didn't have uh, in the brief lay down of the issues in, this, in, this, in these remarks to kind of spell it out, you're quite right that underlying the transactional JCPOA is a transformational bet that in 15 years, when some of the limits start coming off of Iran's nuclear program, that the country may be in a different place. And this goes back to the issue of the two timelines. You address the nuclear issue immediately in a discreet way, and you allow the regime change slash evolution timeline to play out. So you're right, there's an implicit bet there. I think on, the, on Iran, um, there is a transformational dimension to the policy. The, degree to which the president, uh, the, the secretary of state has been more a spokesperson for this than the president himself. But if one looks at um, the, uh, essentially the economic war being waged on Iran by attempting to cut off all oil exports, and, and you see the effects on the Iran, Iran economy, I think the underlying uh, um, assumption is, is implicit, but that you might be able to collapse the regime, or, or, or the regime would face the prospect of collapse that would bring it essentially you know, to its knees, um, uh, to the bargaining table to meet um, 
a broad set of these of these uh, 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 objectives laid out by Secretary Pompeo. So let me give you the flip side of that with mm -hmm. North Korea, which is in North Korea's case, as you point out, you're looking for a highly transactional deal. Mm -hmm. But you have a president who has contended that the relationship is transformed already because of his exchange of, mm -hmm. of now three different times that he has met Kim Jong-un and untold numbers of beautiful letters. Um, and uh, so he would argue that a transformation in the nature of the regime has already taken place. It's just the transaction hadn't happened. Well, that's... <clears throat> um, he may not be defining the word transformational the way you... Yeah, would. I mean, yeah. for a country that is probably the most totalitarian society on the face of the earth and runs kind of gulag-type operations, you know, there's not been any tr sort of domestic, uh, you know, transformation. I, I said, I argue that, that, that the objective with North Korea was transformational because denuclearization uh, up front before sanctions relief um, would require the, 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 the regime to give up capabilities that Director of Central Intelligence Gina Haspel has testified it views as essential for regime, you know, survival. So um, let me turn to the to what happened in Stockholm and at the UN General Assembly, because I think it kind of speaks to your point. Okay. Last weekend in Stockholm, there were working group meetings of U.S. and North Korean diplomats. Those broke down. At the United Nations General Assembly, uh, there was a, a kind of orchestration of diplomacy. Uh, President Macron of France played a leading role to try to bring about a trump Rouhani conversation. It didn't happen. Rouhani, interestingly, said... Um, I'm not interested in a North Korea-style photo op. We have to do kind of a kind of uh, real business here. Um, and we talked a bit about this before, and I tried to kind of frame, uh, to characterize what is the underlying dynamic. And there are so many differences between Iran and North Korea, and in some ways it's misleading to group them together, but we do for other reasons that are understandable, certainly in terms of, of, of uh, on the nuclear side. But with both countries, I see a similar dynamic, which is, the gap between the possible and the adequate, um, that what is possible for one side is inadequate to the other and vice versa, that what we're looking for, what we're prepared to offer is inadequate to the, to the North Koreans and, and Iranians. What they're willing to put on the table is um, what is possible for them is inadequate to us. And what, we're, what the, current, the current focus of diplomacy is how can we bridge this gap between the possible and the adequ adequate and bring it in toward a point where uh, a resolution uh, that would be uh, an optimizing function, which diplomacy is not a maximizing function, but an optim uh, optimal solution that both sides could take some satisfaction in but would be in some measure dissatisfied with. Um, I agree with that. Uh, it, to some degree, that's true in almost any negotiation mm -hmm. for, for a while. What's the characteristic of the North Korea case, though, is that it has always been thus. And while we have had a series of transactions from 1994 forward, we've, they've always ended up b backsliding, and we've always ended up basically trying to do another transaction mm -hmm. that would take you back to where you were, in the course of which they've developed 30 to 60 nuclear weapons, which gives us the moment to sort of talk about the difference between these two. So in North Korea, you've got a country that is already nuclear armed, and as you said at the opening, has a missile program that has done all but the last test mm -hmm. to show that they could reach the United States. In North Korea, you have no nuclear weapons that we know of. Iran. Um, I'm sorry, in Iran's case, you have no nuclear weapons that we know of, and you have no um, missile capability that can reach us, mm -hmm. at least yet, though there's some sharing with, with the North Koreans. Um, that would make you think that, as, as President Obama did, that you're right to focus on Iran first because North Korea is in the rearview mirror at this point. And that's essentially your argument here. They're never giving up all of this stuff. If that's the case, why wouldn't you do the reverse approach from what the president is doing, which is to say sort of freeze out the North Koreans and start up your conversation with the Iranians? That's actually kind of where I'm going on, on, on this. I mean, but just to kind of lay out the dis differences that David alluded to. You know, North Korea has 30 to 60 nuclear weapons. Um, it's on the cusp of a qualitative, 
and quantitative breakout. You know, quantitative because it may it's the number of warheads uh, or the, the amount of weapons usable material they will have fabricated, plutonium and highly enriched uranium, could be as high as 100 by 2020. That's about half the size of the U United Kingdom's arsenal. When I got into this business, I couldn't have imagined North Korea with a nuclear arsenal half the size of Great Britain's. And you juxtapose that to the size of the North Korean economy, $40 billion uh, estimated by uh, the, the CIA. And it's hard to measure the North Korean economy because if it's, it's a barter economy, black market, et cetera. I had to go to Wikipedia. That's the size of Dayton, Ohio. All right. So imagine a, essentially a failed state um, with an arsenal approaching half the size of Great Britain's, running a Manhattan project to be able to target the United States with all but the last piece. And there was a great piece that David and you and, 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 and uh, um, your colleague did abroad on, on um, uh, the status of their capabilities mm -hmm. uh, in 2017, mm -hmm. which could you be updated. Um, uh, um, they've all, they haven't demonstrated reentry and, and targeting, um, but they're, they're very close. It's a complex set of technologies that took the United States a long time. But you take this $40 billion economy, and you know what? We're all familiar with the night visual, this, this single dot in Pyongyang from a satellite and that there are now physical differences between North and South Koreans because a grotesque uh, you know, uh, experiment is being run of feeding South Koreans 2,500 to 3,000 calories a day and North Koreans 1,500 or to 2,000, and there are now physical differences between North and South Koreans. Um, um, this is the character of the, the problem. For North Korea, nuclear weapons, and my colleague Gene Lee's here, um, and we've got Christian Osterman of our Nuclear Proliferation International Project. We've had a lot of research at Wilson done on this. For North Korea, um, nuclear weapons are a bargaining chip. They try to, it's the only thing they can monetize, and it's a deterrent from, uh, from attack. Now, Iran, as you mentioned, it is the more dynamic threat, even though its capabilities uh, are, are far uh, less advanced than that of, that of North Korea. Um, the, the, in, the, 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 the challenge posed by Iran is that it has a uranium enrichment program, and that creates a latent capability for a weapon. Now, I imagine there are some people you know, out in, in, in the audience today who've heard what the, the, the term uranium enrichment for years now, and they're wondering, like, what is that? Uh, in, in brief, it's the multi-stage industrial process uh, in which natural uranium is converted into special material capable of sustaining a nuclear chain reaction. As we recall from high school physics, uranium U-238 contains 1% of U-235. That's the fissionable isotope. So you mine uranium ore, you process it industrially, industrially, you turn it into yellow cake. Remember that one from the Iraq War period, yellow cake. You take the yellow cake, you superheat it, turn it into a gas, uranium hexafluoride. Then you run it through these centrifuges that you've been reading about. You spin those. U U-238, um, uh, the heavier isotope goes to the periphery, the lighter one, U-235 clusters in the center. You take the U-235 and you pass it through a series of, of centrifuges called a cascade, and that produces reactor-grade or weapons-grade material. 3% uranium-235 is good for a reactor. 90% is good for a weapon. The dilemma is that our lawyers who negotiated the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty kind of didn't really watch out for us, uh, and they allow for nor Iran to acquire the, the nuclear fuel cycle for reactors that don't exist and aren't even on the, on the drawing board, um, and that centrifuges that spin to create 3% reactor fuel can keep spinning to create 90% fuel. The, the goal of the JCPOA was to keep that latent capability latent. And one last point, uh, there's a new publication from the Nuclear Proliferation and International History Project coming out on latent capabilities, whereas North Korea views nuclear weapons as essential as for meeting an existential threat. Iran doesn't view that it lives in a neighborhood uh, with an existential threat. We took care of their main threat right next door with Saddam, Saddam Hussein. So Iran's nuclear program is, is uh, uh, it's deliberate, uh, it's purposeful, it's determined, but it's not a crash program. This is technology that's, that's of the era of Glenn Miller and slide rules. Okay, so no, this is not a crash program by Iran to get a, nu to get a nuclear weapon, but they want the hedge, the latent capability, and there's a statement by President Rafsanjani uh, back in the 2000s that all we need to demonstrate to our neighbors is that we have the potential to do it. We don't actually need weapons. So that frames the two challenges they pose. I've argued, last sentence, 
is that we should go for the tr a transactional deal with North Korea to freeze the program. No new nuclear weapons tests, a real freeze on ballistic missile tests, and a declaration of what their facilities are for producing weapons usable material, plutonium and highly enriched uranium, to prevent a bad situation from getting worse. And then with Iran, um, to get us back into the JCPOA constraints. Um, and it's going to require, this is going to be really a heavy lift diplomatically because it will require the United States to lift the secondary sanctions. Macron was getting at this at the UN. Lift the secondary sanctions, permit Iran to, to expo export oil, and then put on the negotiating table these other issues. Um, uh, our colleague David uh, Ottaway was speaking yesterday and Hala Sundiari um, uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at a meeting here about a possible opportunity with Yemen, that that might be an early regional issue that the Iranians might be prepared to engage on uh, with, with the United States, whereas Israel, uh, Syria, Hezbollah, et cetera, is a much more, a much higher priority to, to Iran. They, they, they might not give way. You mentioned ballistic missiles. The Supreme Leader uh, talked about the ballistic missile ranges, limitations of just 2,000 kilometers. If we could lock those kinds of things in, and then rebrand it for our transactional president as a JCPOA plus or a JCPOA 2.0 or JCPOA, not Obama's JCPOA or whatever it would be called. That would, that would, uh, that's a, as I said, that's an analytical option, but I don't know whether the politics will permit us to get there on both it's sides. Interesting question because the domestic politics of this are so different on both sides. Um, in the Iran case, I think it's been a little bit of a surprise to the White House, less so to the State Department, that Rouhani does not have any, did not have any desire to set up a meeting or even that phone conversation that Macron tried to do by putting an open speakerphone line in a <laughs> conference room and then try to lure Rouhani out of his uh, hotel room, I guess with the promise of tea and pistachios, into the same room where the president was hanging on the speakerphone. The speakerphone being critical because Rouhani could then say he never picked up a phone, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, wow. and that didn't happen, and it didn't that happen. That sounds almost Talmudic, but yeah. anyway, go ahead. Um, uh, it didn't happen because for Rouhani, the idea of engaging with the American president is a loser at home. Mm -hmm. And for Kim, the idea of engaging the, the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, right, uh, with the president of the United States right. for the first time in uh, 70 years was a huge win. And um, that difference in dynamic, I think, said everything about how these conversations have gone. But it does take you to the interesting question of where they go now before we open this up to questions from everybody in the audience who wants a, 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 a piece of this as well. So this is a president who has made it clear time and time again that he does not want to go use military force in these cases. In the North Korea case, he moved from fire and fury to say, saying there is no nuclear threat from North Korea now, which one of his aides translated for me from the Trump to that means things are slightly better than before we had the meeting. Okay. Um, in the Iran case, um, he keeps issuing these declarations, they will never have a nuclear weapon, but doesn't say very much about whether they could have some form of nuclear enrichment. Um, his problem there is that whatever deal he signs has got to be more restrictive on the Iranians than the JCPOA was. Mm -hmm. Or annoying journalists will write stories saying, after all that, he got less than what Obama got, which would be, you know, the one thing he could not bear to read. So um, how do you get, on the, on the Iran case... How do you even actually get the two sides engaged into a discussion at this point? Because it strikes me last week or two weeks ago in New York was the moment, and it didn't happen. Um, I, I can't remember. I don't recall who said it, but there was a formulation that I like, which is North Korea and Iran do not respond to pressure, but without pressure, North Korea and Iran will not respond. Um, and... Um, but they have domestic politics too, and and in the case of Rouhani, you saw it played out, kind of in in, in the hotel room. It's a variation of. I remember you reporting from Vienna during the negotiations, and you said, you know, Iran is both a revolutionary state and an ordinary country, and this is the the the, the main dynamic in Iran, trying to sort out this this unresolved 
unresolved identity crisis. And you said the ordinary country guys are in Vienna. The revolutionary guys are back, back, back in, in Tehran. Yeah. Now, after what's happened with the JCPOA, there is um, – and both North Korea and Iran are opaque societies. Iran is perhaps maybe a little less opaque than, than North Korea, but we really don't know much about – kind of internal regime dynamics. You can sort of read it from outside. But they would, you could surmise that they would be skeptical of nuclear diplomacy right now, having had, you know, invested so much in the JCPOA and then seen the withdrawal. And the United States is in, I think, a weak position right now because uh, we've had the, uh, um, the bravado, maximum pressure. Uh, uh, but I think empirically we've, we can now conclude that um, – Maximum pressure uh, cannot achieve transformational goals because countries or states are not going to commit regime suicide. So that invariably pushes you towards the transactional domain of what can uh, what can be done. Um, but the the maximum pressure has painted the Trump administration into a, into a corner. Um, and I think there was a Time magazine cover that had Trump being painted in. In fact, that sort of on a host of issues that sort of that 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 captured that. Um, there have been military threats and then pulling back. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia has seen the United States not respond to the attack on their oil facilities, which was incredible. I mean, you know, 20 drones um, and cruise missiles that got through the uh, multi-billion dollar uh, defense um, uh, system that the Saudis had bought for us. Uh, a report that the Saudis are now talking to the Iranians to sort of hedge their bets if they can't rely on the United States. The Europeans are quietly furious with the United States for having uh, withdrawn from the JSPOA that they invested so much into. And, and European politicians, some have, are on the record as saying they view the current impasse and crisis with North Korea, uh, with Iran rather, as having uh, developed out of that core decision at the beginning to pull out of the JSPOA. So that now as the United States is looking for allied support for meaningful kind of action, including the potential for military action after the, the attack on the oil installations, um, the response has been from Boris Johnson and others that we're not, we're, we're not being pulled into a conflict in the Gulf, the precipitant of which uh, lay in, in your initial action to, to, to pull out of, the, out, of, out, of the, out of the regime. So I think um, uh, the Trump administration, you know, in both Stockholm and, and um, at the, the UN General Assembly, um, is open, at least the president, to transactional diplomacy with both. They'll do an interim deal. They'll do a deal, a uh, transactional deal with North Korea, this kind of freeze. And, and at Stanford's Center for International Security and Arms Control and the Rand Corporation and Johns Hopkins, there have been a host of, of uh, uh, former uh, Los Alamos director Hecker. You know, there have been a number of proposals on what a freeze would be. Um, uh, if it happens, the, Bush, the Trump administration would characterize it as an interim step towards long-term de denuclearization. You know, they, got, they, they, they are very firm in that, but they're also very sensitive when you write, because I've been on the receiving end of this, when you write that their key mistake was not getting a freeze in return for the first meeting in Singapore. Yes, and, and then you wrote, because um, you, were, you were there, I recall the story you talked about, they wanted to go big in Hanoi and is really has foundered on this definition of denuclearization, like which the North Koreans, I think going back to 1992, have said they're in favor of denuclearization. But they mean denuclearization of the entire Korean peninsula, which means U.S. forces out, uh, the end of the threat against the North Korean regime. It's so laden with conditions, um, uh, it would be hard to, to see how would that, that, that would be achieved in the here and now. The, the U.S. focus has been on denuclearization, like give it up up front, in return for sanctions relief. And we're really into this. I would just go back to kind of, uh, you know, my framing comment that, that what we're seeing now is this gap between, you know, what is possible and what is adequate. And that's the sort of space both sides are, are maneuvering in. And I think that, that um, what one has seen in, in Stockholm and at the UN General Assembly is that despite this persisting tension over whether U.S. should be transformational or transactional or go for regime change or behavior change, the administration um, uh, arguably seeking a foreign policy win with one or the other um, is, appears more open to a transactional approach. And the impediment seems to be on the Iranian side of are they going to get snookered into another kind of deal. And with North Korea, um, a sense that there should be another 
Trump Kim summit because they could ba they can perhaps get a better deal out of uh, the president in person, which than they I could think get. explains why Stockholm was a failure. I mean, if yeah. if the previous negotiators mm -hmm. working level at best got fired <laughs> and at worst got executed, depending yes. on who you believe, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, uh, but in any case, aren't around to go negotiate the next right. one. You want to sound as tough as you possibly can be at your first working level meeting, right? So s you get points just for storming out. Yeah. 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 yeah you don't deploy the fallback position for that, sure in the talking points. That's right. Um, great. So I've, I've been dominating all the fun here. So um, let me, uh, for our uh, remaining uh, 15 minutes or so, let's uh, see what all of you have to ask about. We'll start. Young lady, right back there on the on the aisle. Yeah, there's a mic coming to you. Quite like young lady. Thank you very much, um, Hazel Smith. Uh, a great uh, introduction, and I'm looking forward to reading the book, Rob. A couple of comments. I, I one of the basic premises that you can even compare Iran and North Korea in terms of their relationship to uh, U.S. foreign policy uh, is, which you questioned yourself, I think, is is really very important in, in, in terms of thinking about the comparative security challenges. You know, they are completely different. Uh, there's a, and particularly in relationship to your um, transformational versus uh, transactional diplomacy, uh, one of the main differences is that there's still an ideological content to the Iranian uh, mm -hmm. foreign policy. There is no ideological right. content to the North Korean foreign policy. And also something which hasn't been touched on is that the economic uh, uh, conditions of both <coughs> countries are completely different. Uh, uh, sanctions on Iran can upset the middle class. Uh, but in North Korea, because they're not oil producing, uh, the extended sanctions mean starvation because it hits their agricultural sector. So mm. in many, many ways, they're completely different. Uh, one of the outcomes of those differences is that it's easier for the United States to come to uh, an agreement, a security agreement with North Korea because there is no ideology. And at the moment, mm -hmm. um, taking apart the differences within the US foreign policy establishment, uh, partly because of the chaotic nature of the administration at the moment, uh, it does look like that there is a overall, and I'm, I'm writing on this, Trump doctrine, um, taking away from the personalities, which is Amer America first at home, which is a dismissal of allies, which is an absolutely no direct intervention in terms of uh, US military so that there are bodies coming back, uh, a reliance on non-democratic allies in terms of uh, any hot conflicts that are going on. And in the rela relationship of that to North Korea in particular is that in my view, there is the possibility of a deal being done from the US side and from the North Korean side um, if we look back to 94 to 2003, when there was effectively a freeze on the program because of the Geneva Agreement, um, my experience at that time and following the conversations between North Koreans, South Koreans, US, behind doors and in front of doors, was that it was not a prerequisite. It was not uh, by Kim Jong-il um, Jong at the time for US troops to be taken off the peninsula if there was a deal. Um, and there were lots of discussions uh, behind closed doors about white hatting, for instance, of, mm. uh, of <coughs> US troops and both China and Kim Jong. I think Madeleine Albright said in her comments in one of her works that this was not, this was not a major issue. Uh, so I think m my view is that um, there is a possibility of a, of a, of a serious outcome in w which would be in line with your transactional uh, diplomacy between the uh, North Korea and... and uh, and the United States. <coughs> uh, but I think, uh, and I'd like, the question is, um, the issue, okay, now Mr. Bolton is no longer there, that there are maybe less, less rifts inside the foreign policy session of North Korea. Um, is it possible, given the, the, uh, the, as a foreigner, I have to be a bit careful in Washington, <laughs> uh, given, the, uh, gi given the, the clear and visible uh, 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 bureaucratic malfunctioning within uh, between the president and officials uh, for a sustained foreign policy to take place particularly given what we've got with impeachment mr pompeo being involved with that and all the rest of it uh, okay this is a short term but then mr trump's only got another year at the moment okay um that's uh, what at the pentagon they would call a merved question there are a lot of aspects to it let me let me um uh just 
um, pick on one or two points. I think, you know, um, as I acknowledged, like Iran and North Korea, it'd hard be, be hard to have states that are more, uh, greater contrast. Um, we, we treat them together um, for a, a number of respects, one of which is that they were both parties to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. They were inside the treaty, cheating within it. Um, that's different than Iran, Pakistan, uh, Israel, India, and Pakistan that exercise their sovereign right to not um, join the treaty um, and are nuclear weapon states, but they're treated you know, differently. Um, I think that the, there's a potential for transactional diplomacy with North Korea. I've laid out the case for it. Uh, but that transactional diplomacy would not, in the near in, in the near term, entail uh, going to zero warheads for the reasons that that have been discussed. I would acknowledge, uh, and and it's f fair comment that there are three kind of downsides to new transactional diplomacy with with North Korea. The first is uh, the moral hazard argument that you're essentially propping up a regime that r that's running a gulag state. Um, uh, and doesn't have an ideology. It's just a cult of personality, as, and, and a, a dynastic cult of personality as, as has been commented. on. So that, that's one liability. The second is it leaves our allies high and dry, that North Korea has uh, been a nuclear weapon state two, since 2006. Japan and South Korea have been under a North Korean threat for a long time. Uh, and now the, uh, what's precipitated the current crisis is finally the United States uh, you know, which uh, you know, uh, my uh, has, has, has been described as a state with kind of weak neighbors to the north and south, and fish to the east and west. You know, for the first time, America is vulnerable to a North Korean attack. And the third is that that a an interim agreement would essentially be recognizing kind of North Korea as a de facto nuclear weapon state. Um, and those are three valid concerns. But uh, as a card carrying utilitarian. Um, and recognizing that, optim that diplomacy is an optimizing, not a maximizing function. I think that um, uh, a transactional deal makes the best of a bad situation. I've talked about how that approach, uh, taking into account the, the radically different circumstances, could be applied um, in the case of, 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 uh, of North Korea. And one wonders, uh, alternative history, what would have happened if the United States had remained within the JCPOA and used that type of transactional precedent to apply to a freeze in 2017 before this barrage of, 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 of testing that led to the fire and fury comment. So our time is a little bit tight, so we're going to go for short questions and short answers. Jane? The mic's coming to you. Totally endorse Rob's last comment, but my question is, uh, does the total absence of process make any kind of rational assessment of uh, Trump's deals, uh, whether they're transactional or transformational, uh, useful? Well, I, the concluding paragraph of my, my, my uh, monograph is quoting uh, the late, great Alexander George, who wrote the gem of a book, Bridging the Gap. And I've worked on the NSC, but right now I work in a think tank. And he said, look, if you're working in, the, in, in academia or a think tank, your role is to lay out analytical options. And it's the job of the policymaker who can take other factors into account that academics may not have, com have at their access to to render a political judgment of whether that analytical option makes sense or not. Now, David is in, a, and I'm going to tr use the tried and true uh, 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 conference technique of like bounce pass hard question to the other panelists. Mm -hmm. um, you're in a posi better position to comment on like the breakdown of the interagency process. When I was on the National Security Council staff, there was what uh, they would call in the Hill regular order. You had interagency working groups, to, to deputies, committees, pr principals went to the president if he needed to, to, he needed to make a decision. Uh, I read um, over my cornflakes in your newspaper that the president of the United States made a, a kind of a decision to, say, pull U.S. forces out of northern, uh, northern Syria, um, as well, which did not go through that kind of process. So, um, yeah. I, so we've gone from breakdown of process to, at moments, no process, right? And... Um, the Syria one was an interesting example that I think might have been sp inspired a little bit by Kim Jong-un, um, which is to say that uh, if you're Erdogan and you wanted to go get a concession and he knew the positions that the Pentagon, the State Department, others were taking, mm -hmm. he did a weekend call to the president, right, with no other aides particularly around, no prep notes and so forth, knowing what his inclination was, because he had just about pulled the U.S. out of Syria back in December. That's what led Mattis to, to resign. 
and sort of routed around what was left of the process, right? Kim Jong-un's approach to this has been the letters, right? And so you know, if you ask the president what's different about this whole approach, he says, what's different is me, right? I'm meeting with Kim Jong-un. You can't make any progress during working level groups with North Korea because we've tried that for 35 or 40 years and it's gone nowhere because no one will make a decision in North Korea without the number one leader. And no one should make the decision in the United States without the number one leader. So you've got two leaders who are fundamentally have the same sort of view about what the process should be. We'll take a few more. Yeah, right here. Do either of you see any events or circumstances on the horizon that might um, drive the parties to either of these two situations uh, towards the table? Uh, North Korea has talked about a year-end uh, benchmark of some sort. Econo uh, the economic uh, conditions in both countries by sanctions, domestic political considerations. What is out there that we should be watching that might drive these parties uh, to the negotiating table again? I, th I think, um, and uh, working at the Wilson Center, uh, we've got wonderful kind of regional country experts come through. So I'm a, I do comparative proliferation. I consume the expert literature on, on Iran. Um, uh, my sense, you know, digesting that, that literature is that um, the, the Iranians were burnt by the JSPO withdrawal. They're suffering under the uh, secondary sanctions and the oil export that they're just going to have to be for Rouhani to be able to get to the point uh, of of, of uh, talking into the speakerphone uh, uh, metaphorically, I think that, that there's going to have to be some move by the United States first. Um, and it can be a elements of what Macron um, talked about. It could be um, no longer enforcing secondary sanctions or trying to, to really enforce the total oil um, uh, embargo export, which is new to the Trump administration. Recall when they did the JCPOA, Iran had some a figure between 80 and 120 billion in escrowed oil funds because they'd been permitted to sell oil on the international market. They didn't come to the U.S. market, but they went into the into the market. The, the Trump administration to uh, bring maximum pressure to bear is try to shut this off. As some argue trying to precipitate regime collapse, which is not going to happen. Um, but I think that that would be required on the U.S. side with Iran or North Korea. Um, uh, I think that this gap between the um, possible and the adequate is going to be played out probably at another Trump-Kim um, uh, summit meeting, um, perhaps before the 2019 uh, you know, deadline. But um, I don't think uh, those deadlines are soft. Um, uh, we, and it's really just a question of how much denuclearization for how much sanctions relief on what timetable. Um, I'd answer that fairly shortly, um, short form. The Iranians were clear for the past year and were clear again at UNGA, and I saw both um, President Rouhani and, and Foreign Minister Zarif, that um, the return to the JCPOA is their only real requirement. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that Trump can't do because it's a, the terrible Obama deal. But if he announced a timed suspension of sanctions for a year or two or three. That is the essential return to the JCPOA because the United States had only one requirement under the JCPOA, which was to lift a certain set of sanctions. So he could say we're still out of it, mm -hmm. but we're lifting the sanctions. And that would be the sort of the, 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 the art form. For Kim, um, I think the structure of an early next deal is there. They are simply arguing at this point over the definition of Yongbyon, right? If you think about Kim's approach in Hanoi, it was, we close down Yongbyon, you lift the sanctions from 2016 mm -hmm. forward, which were the ones that have really bitten. And then there was the question, well, what, how do you define Yongbyon? Is it what's inside the fence? How about the stuff that feeds Yongbyon that's outside the fence? What about your enrichment capability that the CIA suspects you have at at least two sites outside of Yumbyon? And that's the sort of core of the argument. If they can get to a common definition of Yumbyon, I think that's a deal that Trump would take. He wanted to take it before 
and Bolton and Pompeo both got in his way. Mm-hmm. Bolton's gone. Pompeo's still there. I think he would still get in the way, but I think if they got a broad enough definition, and that's sort of Steve Began's right. job. And one other thing, and there are arguments about what those one other things need to be. I think the answer is pretty simple. It's got to be a freeze. Yeah. Because the first rule of holes is if you're in one, stop digging, right? So they've got to stop making more. I think in, in both cases, they're in transactional mode now. I mean, it's been, it's been a kind of an evolution. Uh, and the, uh, the declaratory policy up front was sort of transformational, the Pompeo parameters, et cetera. But I think now they've paint, they, they recognize um, that they are essentially painted into a corner on these. And if they're going to break these impasses, prevent and not have to just acquiesce to bad things happening, um, they're going to have to pivot to the transactional. I think if you're Donald Trump, You've never, you don't have to pivot to the transactional because you were born in the transactional. <laughs> the rest of his administration needs to right. pivot to the transactional. And that reflects this c- continuing divide over how we address the rogue state issue, regime change, behavior change. And of that, it, it's of a kind. But I think I, I, I concur on, on, on where the president is at from what we can glean. We'll take one more, and then we are going to wrap it up. And it's going to be right back there in the corner. Uh, Holly Svandiari, my esteemed uh, colleague. <laughs> yeah. I'm Holly Svandiari from the Wilson Center. I don't think the Iranian will come to the table with partial lifting of sanctions. The Supreme Leader has made it clear, and he has the final word on these issues, that all sanctions must be lifted, but maybe for He didn't say two years or three years, but all sanctions must be lifted, number one, including sanctions against Zarif and himself. How do you want to negotiate with Zarif when he's sanctioned? That's number two. And number three, the regional issues are off the table, focusing only on the JCPOA, and no bilateral talks between the US and Iran, but the whole JCPOA group can be there and the Iranian will come to the table. Mm. This has been their position. Right, which I, I, the the whole group part of it, I don't see as a problem for the Trump administration. Well, I just, I think, you know, that, that, you know, uh, um, that makes complete sense, what we can surmise from, from looking at Iran. I think that that the sanctioning of the Supreme Leader and Zarif really uh, spoke to this dynamic where they're focused on the character of the regime. I mean, when you, when you sanction the supreme leader, uh, that's a statement about what your objective is vis-a-vis the negotiations in Iran. It's a pleasure to actually think that rational people are trying to put uh, helpful frameworks around U.S. foreign policy these days. I I guess I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic in light of the most recent events uh, with Syria, where there was absolutely no process, absolutely no consultation with our own envoy, the State Department or the Defense Department, so far as I know, or our allies who actually have people on the ground in this uh, area, this where everyone thought we had negotiated safety zones. Um, Having said that, maybe, just maybe, Rob will be right. And David will remain the distinguished scholar that he is, uh, masquerading as a reporter. And maybe, just maybe, uh, rationality will prevail, and we will get to some uh, equilibrium in two countries which have vexed the United States uh, and, and the world for many, many years. It does matter to talk about this. Wouldn't it be nice if some really sound result were achieved? Thanks for coming. Uh, to be continued. And Rob's books are outside. Thank you.